I'm John Levine. Welcome to the Berkeley Writers at Work 30th Anniversary Audio Series. Berkeley Writers at Work launched in 1997 as a forum for campus writers to discuss their writing process. Since then, we have interviewed dozens of faculty writers from the departments of history, psychology, public policy, ethnic studies, and mathematics, just to name a few, to talk about how, where, and when they write. In celebration of UC Berkeley's college writing program's 30th anniversary, we are looking inward, turning the microphone towards our own writers, the vastly talented CWP lecturers, many of whom are successful writers in their own right. For more information about Berkeley Writers at Work, be sure to visit our website at writing.berkeley.edu. CWP colleagues Tim Freeman and Ryan Sloan each read a piece of their magical realism flash fiction. Then they take a deep dive into talking about their writing processes. They cite a number of writers that they admire and they talk about the value of journal writing. They discuss how teaching creative writing is similar and different from teaching college composition. And they end the conversation with advice to student writers. I'm Kim Freeman, and I'm here with Ryan Sloan. Hello. And Ryan, do you want to talk about how you've been in college writing programs? And So I came to Berkeley from grad school at NYU, and uh, I've been here for a long time. I've been here since 2007. Yeah. Yeah, how about you? I came from Northeastern, and it's actually my 10th year now, which it went very fast. I still feel like a newbie, but... 10 years, I'm not a newbie, but I feel like one, so. I'm excited to do this. So you're going to read a piece of fiction, and then so am I, and then we'll talk. Yeah, that sounds good. So I'm going to read a short piece of flash fiction. I think it has a nice start and a finish, so we'll go with that. Okay, so this is How to Break Up at the Musée d'Orsay. First, you'll need tickets to Paris. Two, a romantic adventure you hope will deepen the relationship. You need to believe this one is the one. You'll also need a room at a quaint pre-war walk-up in the Marais, the kind where the gruff hotel keep sleeps in his tiny office at the foot of the winding stairs. Ask said hotel keep for directions to the museum. Be proud that you understood his clipped French. Cross the Pont Neuf and follow the crowds along the Seine. Next, get in line, a long line, that folds back on itself, like taffy or intestines, so that you keep seeing the same silent, miserable family all in orange baseball hats with a squat tee, over and over again. Once inside, stroll through the streams of light that pour from the ceiling of glass. It is like no other. Wander through the sculptures, study the fluid contradiction of marble, note the voluptuous curves of women, the wiry sinews of men, all stuck in their moment like the villagers of Pompeii. Stop for a long while at a piece by Camille Claudel, Read that it's called La Age Mure. A young woman, naked and on her knees, reaches for a naked man, who turns his back to her, who walks away, led by an ancient woman whose arms wrap around the man's shoulders, devouring him. The young woman only has hold of his finger. She's losing her grip in perpetuity. Reach for your boyfriend's hand. Feel your skin flushed when he pulls you in for a kiss. Take a break in the cafe. Peer through the glass clock to see sacre coeur in the distance, order olays and pain au chocolat. Melt a little when he looks at you with his serious brown eyes. Think he might propose. Be surprised when he asks instead, who was the last one before him? Think you're safe. Think you're on the same page. Think he'll understand. Reveal that it was a drunken hookup at your friend's wedding. Watch his face as he calculates. Watch his face as he remembers that the wedding was after you'd started dating. Say it meant nothing. Say you don't remember his name. Say it was a last fling. Say you're all in. Hear him tell you that from the start he wanted you so much that he couldn't look at anyone else. Sit not saying anything like the family in the orange baseball hats for too long. Try to block out the ticking of the glass clock. Hear him say that you aren't to be trusted. Watch him stand. Reach for him. Try to get hold of at least a finger. Hear him tell you not to follow. Watch him disappear, moving like water around the stones in his way as you sit ossifying. Tell yourself to wait. Tell yourself he'll be back. 
Thank you. I should say, in the interest of disclosure, Kim and I have been part of a, a writing group along with our colleague, yeah. Mike Larkin, for quite a while. And um, I love hearing your work. I always love Thank getting you. to experience Thank I haven't, you. This is the first time. Yeah, I haven't seen this one. Yeah. 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 So we were going to ask each other just, you know, quick questions about, about the piece read. I have a couple, but I think the most pressing one is what was the most enjoyable part for you about writing this? Writing the little details of Paris, turning details that were real life into then fictional details. And I also enjoyed kind of doing the uh, second person thing, yeah. which is tricky. I know it doesn't always work, but thinking along the lines of like Lori Moore and things like that. So that was kind of fun, getting those little details in there. Yeah, the second person, the, the imperative, mm -hmm. you know. It's a way of distancing, but also putting the reader in. I enjoy that aspect of it. Yeah, I love that sort of tension between, you know, the particularity. What was the line? There's something about intestines and... Uh, oh, yeah, the uh, is it a long line that folds back on itself like taffy or intestines. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it sets, sets the tone for what's coming. Starting what's... to shift that, not just lovely Paris stuff, but yeah. the things are... Uh, not so good under the surface. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little complicated yeah. as we're digesting. Yes, exactly. Good. Well, this piece actually has some resonance with that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is also flash fiction. It's called Cusp. An hour before her wedding, Lark met her mother-in-law, a gnarled knot of a woman. She was handed a pale envelope wrapped in opalescent ribbon. Against her wishes, Lark's fiancé had secretly created a gift registry. They had fought over it all through the night. Not the gifts, but what the gifts represented. What was expected, what was owed. Lark already owned a saucepan. She had at least five unchipped plates. She was an adult, or something like it. A somewhat sleep-deprived adult, about to be married. Now, in opposite corners of City Hall, her long-divorced parents filibustered. Her fiancé claimed to love Lark for her self-taught, feral qualities. But even she knew graciousness was expected in moments like this. She sliced her thumb, opening the envelope, and she reached inside. Christ, said Lark, these are teeth. Are these his baby teeth? They're your responsibility now, the woman said. She disappeared before the judge had even arrived. Five years later, Lark lugged a box of wine through the nearly empty apartment. She found the envelope jammed behind a drawer. There were fewer teeth inside than she remembered. She sat next to the raised garden long dead that they built as newlyweds. Lark plucked a tiny tooth. She thumbed its pearlescent ridges. She tried to remember photos of her ex as a boy and recalled that even at five, his default expression had been a shit-eating grin. Her friends often described their own children as innocent and in need of protection, but Lark had endured trips to the local playground with its foam-padded savagery and pint-sized bullies and mothers who insisted that Lark, against all evidence to the contrary, would one day want this for herself. With a small, ironic blessing, she planted the tooth in the loamy soil of the garden. She watered it with a splash of rosé. The next afternoon, a potential roommate asked, What kind of plants are those? The garden had exploded with life, ripe tomatoes six feet high. Every one was a mottled hue of blue. She considered calling her ex. They were his teeth, after all. Instead, Lark took the train to her childhood home. She planted a tooth in the backyard and spent the rest of the evening tucking into her father's Costco whiskey and discovering her old crushes now had happy, hideous families. She woke the next morning to a scratching sound outside the sliding glass door, and there was Boots, her childhood cat. And Boots was not quite right. Covered in soil, with a meow like the hinge of a rusty gate, his fur was a coral pink that hummed in the dark. She had one tooth left. Lark rolled the tiny cuspid between her fingers like a prayer bead. Could it fix her marriage? She did not think she even wanted that to be fixed. What then? Lark felt the smoothness of the tooth in her hand. She placed it on her tongue, and she swallowed. Great, thank you. And this is the second time I'm getting to hear it, but uh, it's so nice to be able to have that distance and you pick up on things differently at different times. So I'm going to throw the, your question back at you. What did you enjoy about writing this piece? A couple things. I mean, one thing was the permission to create a kind of magical realist 
you know, scenario mm -hmm. that comes out of something um, a little bit playful, but bittersweet. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you, I was motivated to write something that was deliberately short. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, I kept compressing over time, mm -hmm. which is so painful to have to do. And sometimes you end up with something you're, you're really happy with. I will admit that right before this session, I was still editing this story, right? Still trying to tweak it, thinking about how it would come across read out loud. It will probably continue to be tweaked until it exists somewhere in the world, and I'll continue to tweak it after that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think both of us, and I also know writing, are working often on longer projects. Mm -hmm. So how are you feeling about these flash pieces, or how do you engage with them? I find them really challenging yeah. myself. It's funny, it's a different set of formal constraints, right? I think for a long time, because I've been working on this novel project that you've seen lots of pieces of, it takes years, right, to do that. And I used to think that some flash fiction, it was just a distraction, it's wasted time, I should just be building new chapters. And lately, I've come to realize what a joy it is to have this generative creative space to create smaller things that can exist on their own. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what, what about you? Yeah, a similar, I think I thought it was like a process, getting stuff out there to kind of build well. But I think it also, it's refreshing to have the new thing because then you can go back to the thing that you've been maybe working on for too long, <laughs> perhaps, and have something with fresh eyes. So I think it's very generative in a different way and you can learn how pieces interact with one another. I also it, it, been enjoying working with Ryan and seeing the changes in his work. And I know that you work a lot with magical realism. So maybe we'll kind of go with that. His novels, a lot of that has those elements. So maybe we'll start with that. What are some of your kind of writerly fascinations? Yeah. I think one of the really interesting things over time is starting to really look at the things that are exciting for us as writers. It's something we talk about with our students all the time. Right. You know, like lean into the stuff that you're really passionate about, you're excited about, or that you really want to investigate. For me, I've come to realize that there are these questions around, I guess I, I would call it um, the lie that tells the truth, that this sort of motif that, that comes up in fiction a lot, but really the pleasures of self-deception for characters, right? And, and the way that that starts to unfold. And for me, magical realism, and we'll probably get to this later on, but some of the really formative books that I remember like really being dazzled by were Bulgakov's Master Margarita, mm -hmm. Rushdie's Satanic Verses, where you see magical realism in the service of sometimes really complex emotional and political topics, but also you get at things from the side in a way that I think is so exciting to tackle. How about, how about you? What are you thinking about in terms of your, your own fascinations? I think I tend to, not just self-deception, more or less self-destruction. Yeah. <laughs> I find really interesting. And a lot of my characters have very bad habits. I, I think I'm just interested in that in general, why we are attracted to the things that hurt us. And I seem to come back to that quite a bit. And quite like literally, I've you know engaged with issues of killing oneself a lot. All you know these things that have personal resonance as well, my family history. But that also then I take of it in the, these different ways in which yeah we hurt ourselves. And so I think there's that, and there's also trying to write from characters that don't do good things. You know, and it's a tricky balance between empathy for those characters and also exploring why is it that people do these horrible things. And so I think that's what I find interesting. No, it's a great challenge. And frankly, much more interesting for a reader with yeah. that kind of moment. If everyone's just nice all the time, it's, it's a pretty short story. Exactly. It's like that doesn't go very far. So mm -hmm. those are the things that I think I come back to. And two, we're more and more engaging with kind of a magical realism or slipstream. I mean, I'm currently reading the newest Kelly Link collection. Yeah. White Cat, Black Dog. Skinder's Veil. Vale. Oh, uh, I don't know if you've gotten to that yet. But not it's, yet. That it's one. Yeah, I'm just like in this I just finished Prince Hat last night. Yeah. And the way that she is able to use our daily banal lives and but then put this element of magic. Same with Karen Russell and other Absolutely. writers that I know that you, you know, that we can find magic in our lives too. I think especially in things that seem so kind of quotidian and to be able to see that really is just one of the things that is a joy to me as well. No, I, I absolutely agree. I think there's something, you know, we talk about it when we're teaching creative writing, where one of the great advantages of fiction is that you can, you know, I think we're always taught, write what you know. Right. And sometimes it can also be interesting to write what you know emotionally, but to really step away from, you know, a careful recording of fact. Right. We were just talking in 
my craft of fiction class a couple of days ago about, you know, what, what happens when you're writing about family members who don't want to be written about, mm-hmm. right? How do you get into the stuff that matters to you on a, on a deeper level, mm-hmm. but you're still maybe freed up from having to tell a story in a way that is, is limited purely by fact, right? Mm-hmm. And by our memories of that, which are flawed anyway, mm-hmm. right? I feel like that slight layer of magical realism where there's just one variable that's off, where something's just a little skewed, allows you to get at so many other things that are truer in their own way. Right, with that kind of capital T true. Yeah. Right. And you mentioned a couple of times some interesting connections between things that obviously for us are writerly fascinations then. How do you see that informing you as a teacher? You've mentioned a couple of things. How do you try to encourage students to follow their writerly fascinations, both in fiction writing and then we also teach, you know, a lot of the R&C classes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so core to my pedagogy, I think, at this point. I, I think it is for you as yeah, well. Yeah, it is, yeah. This idea that no matter what else, and what are we, what are we doing, you know, as, as instructors, at the core of it, it really should be trying to create the conditions for people to really feel like they can pursue their own passions or even to identify them or to think through what's really complex and tricky there. Yeah. Right? So in the research writing classes that that I teach, it becomes increasingly like a choose your own adventure mm-hmm. kind of process in which we're always cycling back to the kinds of topics and angles that are interesting for them. And for fiction, you know, some of my students have never written a story before mm-hmm. and are intimidated by the constraints of form and just writing on a regular basis. I'm intimidated by that. Right, right. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. And so I think a lot of what we've tried to do is create a kind of generative play, mm-hmm. you know, and collaborative kinds of situations so that we're modeling some of some of these kinds of techniques, but still also creating, leaving the door cracked open, right? For what are you excited about? What's strange for you? What's, you know, so there's sometimes there's, there's prompts that I give students. There's a lot of conferencing and encouragement right. about leaning into where the intellectual or literary heat is. Mm-hmm. But how about you? What do you, you think? I mean, similar in the, definitely in the 4B, I try to, you know, I approach it also from a disciplinary yeah. perspective, not just what are they interested in, but per, what I hope that they have a personal interest in their disciplines so that these things aren't separated out, you know? And so we do read some common text, but then most of that is in to generate, well, which, which aspects spark some joy to be a little Marie Kondo, but, <laughs> but which some spark some joy for you? And can we work with those, that academic research like fiction writing could be joyful and interesting. Yeah. And I think, you know, being open to not knowing and not having that, it can be a little scary for a lot of students. I mean, it'd be easier to just have a plan and have it easily map out. So trying to get them to, if not enjoy that space, start to feel comfortable with that not knowing that I think is so vital to our fiction writing too. When you, I mean, I think we both have that sense of you're not sure where your yeah. story is going to go. And that's both that's right. exciting and also can be numbing and sort of terrifying sometimes when you sit down to not have a plan, you know. It's the E.L. Doctorow quote, you know, so often, especially with writing a novel, but really any kind of writing, that you're driving in the dark with the headlights off. Yes. And maybe, to make it a bit safer of a metaphor, you know you've got to get to Topeka. Right? <laughs> right. There's a lot, a lot of roads right. that could get you there. Right. But you're figuring it out along the way. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you a question just about process then. What are the kinds of processes or combinations of things that work for you in the writing that you do? I'm always trying new things, being pretty disciplined about it and trying to, I do write five days a week, definitely. I try to get up and crazy early. I love getting up in the dark and having that time when most of the other world is quiet, except there's a little bit of cat petting that has to happen because they're always up. But to have some of that time regularly. And then lately, I've been also trying to work in once a day, trying to do what I call my incident observation journal. I have like four different kinds of journals I keep at this point. It's a little crazy where I'm just tracking something that happened and trying to describe it without judgment, without story, without, because I feel like that helps warm me up for getting to that kind of concrete writing that you want to have even in worlds that you're making up. And so that's one technique that I have found very helpful, even if it doesn't necessarily lead to something that I'm going to use directly. So multiple journals, a process journal that I love, that I got this idea from Ruth Ozeki. She has her, had her going since like 1996. It's one word document and she mm-hmm. just logs in. But it's where you can kind of play around with ideas and write. It's a softer way of, you know, not just opening your Scribner document or whatever and having to, okay, you're writing now, but like doing these other little things that kind of ease you or trick your mind into, oh, and there we go. There's now I'm writing. 
Does that make some sense? So those are some things that I do. What about you? Do you have techniques? So um, Amy Bender often talks about the importance of first thing, you know, maybe even before you even have coffee, certainly before you ever look at your phone or, right, right. you know, uh, you know, have the laptop set up so that it can only be opened to things that are that you're working on before your brain has a chance, right, to mm-hmm. sort of cut away the dream space, right, right. where part of your your brain, however nonsensically, right, is processing some of this, this stuff. I, it's funny, I really envy morning people. I think that's a great gift. I find that sometimes I'm blearily just staring at that screen the yes. way that and my students talk about as well. Mm-hmm. There are ways for me to trick myself into it, for sure. I think that if I leave myself a hook from the previous day's writing or the previous moment's writing, right. if I can go back and edit a little bit from that work, I can get back into the headspace mm-hmm. where I left off. A lot of what my process involves is giving myself permission to write at strange times, at, at odd times, mm-hmm. to be okay with the fact that not everything is going to end up in the book at all. Mm-hmm. I've been leaning more and more into having a variety of documents, kind of like you, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a Google Doc that's just, you know, like a play space, essentially, right? As well as index cards and color coding and different kinds of tactile you know, sometimes I'll, I'll work on a, like a whiteboard on mm-hmm. campus to map out different ideas. Right. Anything to get out of the tyranny of that linear space on the page that can be, I think for me, an impediment to creativity. Because mm-hmm. it's like, well, I gotta be really efficient. Even though I would tell my students, like, play, absolutely. Play, exactly. But for me, no, I've gotta be very efficient. Well, it kind of leads to my question about, we've touched on this already, but ways does your writing inform your teaching and what we do your teaching inform your writing? It's a great gift to... And I mean this sincerely, to be able to work at college writing programs yes. where we have a lot of autonomy, Yes. right? We can bring our own passions and interests to the courses we teach, right? So, I mean, my, my courses are completely built at this point around my fascination. So right. a class on liars and tricksters and con artists or the research class that is, you know, increasingly built around the way technology and, and the self are so intertwined, mm-hmm. but not just in terms of theme, but also in terms of reassessing structures that can really be driven by student discovery, right? That, mm-hmm. that sometimes I think my role as an educator is, is at least partly someone who set up a really elaborate Rube Goldberg machine, mm-hmm. right? Where like, there's lots of moving pieces, but really you're going to be building some of those pieces with me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's up to you to decide the configuration. Like you figure out where you want to go and I'm just going to keep providing a sort of bounded playground, right? For that, it's a mixed metaphor. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I think for me, there's a lot of creativity in the course design and the way that you're improvising a little bit based on where students seem to be in that moment. And then if I'm candid, there's also the reality that near the end of a semester, you know, my, my focus and, and has just sort of shifted, right? So that there's a, a diminished space for creative writing. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the semester, oh, it's very exciting. You know, then, then you can sort of rebalance those to a certain degree. So I find it pretty sustaining, but also immersive, right? The work that we do. Yeah. How about you? What do you think? Oh yeah. Similarly, I think, you know, I try to also be very explicit with my students about process and that mine is a mess too. And so I'll sometimes show them drafts of things with some of my academic writing versus some of, oh, if I get feedback from an editor and I can show, look, look, it doesn't only happen from teachers. Like this happens in the real world and kind of try to show them that as well. But I think it also keeps me, like right now, I'm, you know, I've, I've been trying new techniques for teaching and a lot of little scaffolded assignments. And I'm realizing that I have um, broken things down too much and there's just too many. Yeah. But it keeps me on my toes to rethink about having to approach something a new way with every new class and every new personality that I think helps me keep out of bad habits on in my own writing, if that makes any sense. It makes a ton of sense. So yeah. we're having to constantly... And this is one of the things I love about teaching is that every semester is new yeah. and every class is new. And so you constantly, you can't just rest on your laurels or rest on habits, you know, and, and I think that's really, it's frustrating at times too, but it's also, <laughs> also really invigorating. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I, I'm continuously refreshing, you know, like the text that, that we're reading, I'm, I'm, you know, frequently culling, you know, actively soliciting ideas from students as well, but that kind of way in which the course is a living document yeah, absolutely. very much, you know, carries over into the, the kinds of creative writing that we do, right? Where it's, it's this organic 
thing. And some parts are very presentable, right? And other parts are very much in development. Yes, and trying to share that with students. Love for that. Let them allow to have that messiness. Yeah. Because, you know, they, it's easier if it's neat, but it's just not always. What would one piece of advice that you would be to give to students about writing? Along with what we've emphasized around really leaning into your own opportunities for fascination, mm -hmm. things that don't have easy answers. The other bit of advice that I would give is that writing is so solitary. It's just you, mm -hmm. and if it's an essay, you know, the evidence that you've gathered, if it's a story, you know, like these sort of like raw mm -hmm. questions and maybe images that you're grappling with. And because of that, I think I've come to realize more and more in adulthood how community is so sustaining and to really find the readers like you right. from my work who right. you trust and who seem to get what the piece seems to want to be as opposed to trying to make it into something that that they need it to be but but having a community of people who are also trying to write and figure these things out mm -hmm. is enormously nourishing absolutely it can be both isolating and kind of competitive mm -hmm. you know in the larger writing world. And so finding your trusted readers and buying them coffee is a good <laughs> idea, I think. Absolutely. And for you? For me, I mean, I think similarly having a sense of play, but also to learn to be comfortable with writing for a variety of reasons. Yeah. To allow yourself that messiness of your journal writing or messiness of the process writing versus understanding that how I'm going to write for that professor might be a little different from how I write from, that there's no fixed idea of what good writing is is that every piece, every occasion needs something different. And so if they can be aware of that and be comfortable with that, even though it's frustrating, that'll save them, you know, what are you trying to persuade or who are you trying to reach? Who are you trying to interest here? And I think awareness of not just audience, but also why are you writing? Are you writing to figure out what you think here? Or are you writing to persuade somebody of something or to inform somebody? So I think being aware that different kinds of writing, that no one thing fits all. And being comfortable with that is something else that's really helpful for me and for I hope my students. Yeah, 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 I like that. Right, we're writing for our smartest friend. Yeah, in some ways, right, as opposed to for an instructor. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although that does happen. Yes, that's great. Good. That seems really helpful. Yeah, I think so. Well, this has been fun. This is great. Let's do three more hours of this. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening to Berkeley Writers at Work audio series, a production of the college writing programs at UC Berkeley. You can find more information about our program at writing.berkeley.edu. I'm John Levine.